Well, welcome everybody to Come Follow Me, a doctrinal and a historical context video for Doctrine and Covenants section 109 through 110. Before we begin tonight, I thought we would just promote the Saints book that we talked about before and the chapter that you should be covering this week in order to stay current with your Come Follow Me is chapter 21, The Spirit of God. And I highly recommend this has a lot of great insights and in a story format. So as per usual, we're going to deal with this historical map summary that talks about when each of the sections was given. And you can see that we're in 1836 for section 109 and 110. They're only a week apart and they're given in Kirkland. However, just as an aside, I want to show you section 137 and notice the date there, January the 21st, 1836. This was a vision given to Joseph Smith the prophet in the temple at Kirkland. The occasion was the administration of the ordinances in preparation for the dedication of the temple. So it's not chronologically in order, but I just wanted you to be aware of it and then we'll be dealing with it in weeks to come. Okay, on to section 109. Church members in Kirkland had been working for about two and a half years to build the house of the Lord. On March 26, the First Presidency, with their two scribes, Warren Cowdery and Warren Parrish, met in the President's Room in the attic of the temple to prepare for the dedication. Oliver notes in his diary that in the meeting he assisted in writing a prayer for the dedication of the house. The written prayer was given to the prophet by revelation, and that's really what we have in section 109, the dedicatory prayer. The following morning, Sunday, a crowd of approximately 1,000 people filled the temple to capacity. This left hundreds of people outside, including many of whom had made sacrifices to help build the temple. At the prophet's suggestion, they were directed to hold a meeting in the adjacent schoolhouse Others returned home to await a secondary dedication event that happened later in the week. The dedication began with an opening prayer and a hymn, after which Sidney addressed the congregation for two and a half hours. He was quite the speaker. He then presented Joseph Smith's name to be sustained as prophet and seer. After a 20-minute break, I guess uh, almost nobody left because they were afraid to give up their seats. The prophet briefly spoke to the congregation and called for sustaining a vote of the rest of the church leaders, the prophet then read aloud the dedicatory prayer. The meeting concluded with the congregation giving the Hosanna shout, which they did by proclaiming loudly, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to God and the Lamb. Amen, amen, and amen, three times. Now, some people have questioned why this is done three times. This is a throwback to some of the ancient languages in the original Hebrew, there was no way of saying good, better, or best. You just had to say good, 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 or good, good, good. So three times is significant that this Hosanna shout was so important. The Kirkland Temple served as a pattern for the dedication of all the other temples. I was searching on the internet and I found this website that I thought I'd tell you about. It's a 3D website models created by Brian Olson. And I've listed the website that you can go to visit. And that's where I drew this particular diagram from. The website is called photogent.com. I'll warn you that he's in the midst of changing over websites. And this is the newest website. So some of the temples are on one and some are on the other website. But this website will direct you to all of them. You'll notice that it, it's more colorful than what you would see in actual fact today if you went to the temple. And the colors are uh, reasonably correct, as far as I can tell. This is an interior split away of the temple, and you can see that there were three floors. The first and second floor were open in the middle so that you could get in as many as a thousand people as they did when the temple was dedicated. And then in the upper area, you can see in the attic, there are rooms for teaching. The only other time that a dedicatory prayer for a temple has been canonized was during the dedication of Solomon's temple. And you can read that in 1 Kings chapter 8. 
So let's get into section 109. The first thing that they say is, Thanks be to thy name, O Lord God of Israel, who keepest covenant and showest mercy unto thy servants who walk uprightly before thee with all thy heart. And then they reiterate here that they were commanded to build a house to the Lord and that they have completed this commandment. And then they ask that he accept the house For thou knowest that we have done this work through great tribulation and out of our poverty we have given of our substance to build a house to thy name that the Son of Man might have a place to manifest himself to this people. It's not very often that we give thanks for the hardships that we go through. But truly as you do the historical study of this era that these people who were extremely poor gave everything that they could, everything that they had in order to get this temple done. The saints were few in number, and most of them very poor. Had it not been for the assurance that God had spoken and commanded that a house should be built to his name, an attempt towards building the temple under the then existing circumstances would have been, by all concerned, pronounced preposterous. With very little capital except brain, bone, and sinew, combined with unwavering trust in God, men, women, and even children worked with their might all living sparingly as possible so that every cent might be used for the grand object while their energies were stimulated by the prospect of participating in the blessing of a house built by the direction of the Most High and accepted by Him. That by Eliza R. Snow. Between June 1833 and March 1836, church members sacrificed time, money, and possessions to help build a house for the Lord The men volunteered their labor on the construction. The women made clothing, provided lodging. While many of the men were away at Zion's camp, which we talked about a few weeks ago, some women continued to work on the temple. Some Latter-day Saints like John Tanner and Vienna Jacques, who we've talked about before, gave much of their wealth to the building of the temple. Others contributed skilled labor. For example, Brigham Young baptized a man named Artemis Millet in Canada. Brother Millet gave up his job as a stonemason for the Canadian government so he and his family could move to Kirkland, where he served as the superintendent of the construction of the temple. In all, the temple cost approximately 60000 U.S. dollars, an incredible sum for that time, considering the poverty of the saints. By comparison, that amount would be worth well over a million U.S. dollars today. So in Canadian funds, that would be over a million and a half dollars. Imagine the bishop of our ward coming to us and saying, okay, we're going to build a temple and we need a million and a half dollars to do it. No help from anybody else, just our ward. And really the number of saints at the beginning in Kirkland was only about 150, so it would be a small ward. Imagine the amount of sacrifice that would require for us even today to do that. Uh, This from Elder John A. Woodstow from the Utah Genealogical and Historical Magazine. I think that is what it means to me and to you and to most of us. We have gone into these holy houses with our minds freed from the ordinary earthly cares and have literally felt the presence of God. In this way, the temples are always places where God manifests himself to man and increases his intelligence. A temple is a place of revelation. We again emphasize the personal blessings of temple worship and the sanctity and safety that are provided within these hollowed walls. This is from Howard W. Hunter. It is the house of the Lord, a place of revelation and of peace. As we attend the temple, we learn more richly and deeply the purpose of life and the significance of the atoning sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us make the temple, with temple worship and temple covenants and temple marriage, our ultimate earthly goal and the supreme mortal experience. All of our efforts in proclaiming the gospel, perfecting the saints, and redeeming the dead lead to the holy temple. This is because the temple ordinances are absolutely crucial. We cannot return to God's presence without them. I encourage everyone to worthily attend the temple or to work toward the day when you can enter that holy house to receive your ordinances and covenants. In verse 14 and 15, we learn that all those who shall worship in this house may be taught words of wisdom out of the best books, that they may seek learning even by study and also by faith. Elder D. Todd Christofferson of the Quorum of the Twelve taught, In all the ordinances, especially those of the temple, 
we are endowed with the power from on high. This power of godliness comes in the person and by the influence of the Holy Ghost. He further explained the fullness of the Holy Ghost includes what Jesus described as the promise which I will give unto you of eternal life, even the glory of the celestial kingdom. Verse 20 of section 109 says, And that no unclean thing shall be permitted to come into thy house to pollute it, and when thy people transgress any of them, they may speedily repent and return unto thee, and find favor in thy sight, and be restored to the blessings which thou hast ordained to be poured out upon those who shall reverence thee in thy house. Inscribed on each temple are the words holiness to the Lord. That statement designates both the temple and its purpose as holy. Those who enter the temple are also to bear the attributes of holiness. Our Redeemer requires that his temples be protected from desecration. No unclean thing may enter his hallowed house. That from President Russell M. Nelson. Further in section 109 and verse 22 we read, And we ask thee, Holy Father, that thy servants may go forth from this house armed with thy power, that thy name may go upon them, and thy glory be round about them, and thine angels have charge over them. The Lord had been pushing the saints for many years to build a temple. And the reason he wanted them to build the temple was that so that he could endow them with power. So from Elder David A. Bednar we have, Called missionaries can be armed with power through the covenants and ordinances of the holy temple. Going to the temple and having the spirit of the temple go through you precedes effective service as full-time missionaries. Just like anciently, before the Lord sent out the twelve apostles, after his death and resurrection, he told them to wait until they received an endowment of power. Another part of this prayer, this dedication, in verse 24, we read, We ask thee, Heavenly Father, to establish the people that shall worship and honorably hold a name and standing in this thy house to all generations and for eternity, that no weapon formed against them shall prosper, that he who diggeth a pit for them shall fall into the same himself that no combination of wickedness shall have power to rise up and prevail over thy people, upon whom thy name shall be put in this house. During the construction of the Kirkland Temple, they had problems with mobs who tried to destroy the temple. Uh, President Brigham Young told of laborers having to hold a sword in one hand to protect themselves and then do their work with the other hand. At times, the men who worked on the temple during the day had to guard it at night. This was very similar to the time anciently when the Israelites had been taken away by Babylon and then allowed to return by Cyrus the Great, who was the king then of the Persians, who had conquered the Babylonian Empire. And they too had to restore the temple and build the temple with one hand working while the other hand held a weapon. You can read about that in Nehemiah. Probably handle that next year with our Come Follow Me. Let the anointing of thy ministers be sealed upon them with power from on high. Let it be fulfilled upon them as upon those on the day of Pentecost. Let the gifts of tongues be poured out upon thy people, even cloven tongues as of fire in the interpretation thereof. And let thy house be filled as with a rushing mighty wind. We have this from Oliver Cowdery. In the evening I met with the officers of the church in the Lord's house. The Spirit was poured out. I saw the glory of God like a great cloud come down and rest upon the house, and fill the same like a mighty rushing wind. I also saw cloven tongues like as of fire rest upon many, while they spake with other tongues and prophesied. And so you can see the fulfillment of this particular prayer. Further to that, we have Benjamin Brown. Many visions were seen. One saw a pillow or cloud rest down upon the house bright as when the sun shines on a cloud like as gold. Two others saw three personages hovering in the room with bright keys in their hands and also a bright chain in their hands. Remember that three angels were seen and they were holding keys. That becomes important later. Orson Pratt, God was there. His angels were there. The Holy Ghost was in the midst of the people. They were filled from the crown of their heads to the soles of their feet with power and inspiration of the Holy Ghost. That evening, over 400 priesthood bearers met in the temple. While George A. Smith was speaking, a noise was heard like the sound of a rushing mighty wind which filled the temple. All the congregation 
simultaneously arose, being moved upon by an invisible power. Many began to speak in tongues and prophecy. Others saw glorious visions. I beheld the temple was filled with angels. David Whitmore bore testimony that he saw three angels passing up the south aisle. The people of the neighborhood came running together because they heard all this noise and they saw the light. Others saw angels hovering over the temple and heard heavenly singing. There's one story of a little boy coming into his mother saying, come outside, come outside. There are people walking on the temple. And sure enough, she went outside and she could see angels walking on top of the temple. Now, this is an interesting thing in section 109, verses 62. We therefore ask thee to have mercy upon the children of Jacob, or Israel, as he was later called, that Jerusalem from this hour may be redeemed. It's very interesting to note that there is no Israel in the world at this time. And then in verse 67, And may all the scattered remnants of Israel who have been driven to the ends of the earth come to a knowledge of the truth, believe in the Messiah, and be redeemed from oppression and rejoice before thee. Now remember, this is 1836. I thought I'd do a little quick history, because I'm a history nerd, on what happened since 1836. We have the dedicatory prayer. Then in 1838, Britain established a consulate in Jerusalem, the very first one. 1840, the Times, a big English paper, reported that the government was considering a Jewish restoration. 1842, Joseph Smith sends Orson Hyde to dedicate the land of Israel for the return of the Jews. In 1862, Moses Hess, who was a former associate of Karl Marx, yeah, that Karl Marx, but they got into a big argument and he broke off from them. He wrote, Rome and Jerusalem, the last national question calling for the Jews to create a socialist state in Palestine as a means of settling the Jewish question. Then in 1881, the Tsar of Russia sponsors a huge wave of pogroms or massacres in the Russian Empire, and that creates a massive wave of Jews leaving Russia to go to America. So many Russian Jews arrive in Jaffa, in Palestine, the town ran out of accommodation, and the local Jews began forming communities outside the city walls. In 1897, an official organization, a movement called Zionism, is created and meets every year thereafter. In 1918, after the end of World War II, the League of Nations endorses the establishment of a British mandate in Palestine, or what we now call Israel. You have to recall that at the end of World War I, the Ottoman Empire was on the losing end of the war, and so their entire empire is split out among the, the major victorious powers. So England got Palestine, or Israel. 1933, we have the rise of Adolf Hitler, which of course increased a huge Zionistic support and immigration because of well, what then becomes the Holocaust from 1941 till the end of the war. 1947, Britain announces they would withdraw from Palestine. They no longer wanted the problems associated with the difficulties that had come up between the Arabs and the Israelis. And then the United Nations General Assembly votes to partition Palestine into an Arab state and a Jewish state. Then in 1948, so this is 112 years after the dedication of the Kirkland Temple, the leaders of the Jewish community in Palestine declare independence in accordance with the UN resolution and Israel is established as a Jewish state. So when Joseph Smith gave this prayer in 1836, there was no Israel. There was no place, no land for the Jewish people to, to be. They were outcasts throughout all the world and scattered everywhere. Then in 1948, Israel is created. Of course, it's been a conflict zone ever since. Approximately 40% of the Jews of the, throughout the world now live in Israel. From the teachings of the presidents of the, ch of the church, Joseph Smith said, We are the favored people that God has made choice of to bring about the latter-day glory. It is left for us to see, participate in, and help to roll forward the latter-day glory when the saints of God will be gathered in one from every nation and kindred and people and tongue, when the Jews will be gathered together into one, which we today are witnessing. The wicked will also be gathered together to be destroyed, as spoken of by the prophets. The Spirit of God will also dwell with his people and will be withdrawn from the rest of the nations, and all things, whether in heaven or on earth, will be in one, even in Christ. Of course, he's speaking of the millennium. 
Another part of his prayer I thought we'd touch on. Remember all thy church, O Lord, with all their, their families and all their immediate connections, with all their sick and afflicted ones, with the poor and the meek of the earth and the kingdom, which thou set up without hands, that's reference to Daniel, may become a great mountain and fill the whole earth, that thy church may come forth out of the wilderness of darkness and shine forth fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners. From President Hinckley we read, We are witnessing the answer to that remarkable pleading. Increasingly, the church is being recognized at home and abroad for what it truly is. There are still those, not a few, who criticize and rebel, who apostatize and lift their voices against this work. We have always had them. They speak their mind as they walk across the stage of life. Then they are soon forgotten. I suppose we always will have them as long as we are trying to do the work of the Lord. The honest in heart will detect that which is true and that which is false. We go forward marching as an army with banners emblazoned with the everlasting truth. We are a cause that is militant for truth and goodness. Everywhere we go we see great vitality in this work. There is enthusiasm whenever it is organized. It is the work of the Redeemer. It is the gospel of good news. It is something to be happy and excited about. So one week later, on Easter Sunday, April the 3rd, 1836, approximately a thousand people gathered to the temple again to worship. And during that meeting, they were instructed by Thomas B. Marsh and David W. Patton, who were senior members of the, of the Twelve. And that afternoon, Joseph assisted members of the quorum to administer the sacrament to the congregation. Later in the meeting, Joseph and Oliver went to the elevated pulpits on the west end of the lower court of the temple and lowered the veils, which were canvas curtains, that surrounded the pulpits. After they prayed, the prophet and Oliver had a vision of the glorified Jesus Christ who spoke to them. That visitation was followed by the appearance of Moses, Elias, and Elijah, who committed priesthood keys to the prophet and to Oliver. An account of that sacred experience is recorded in the prophet's journal and was later published and we have it now as Doctrine and Covenants section 110. This is the very first part of that section. The veil was taken from our minds and the eyes of our understanding were opened. We saw the Lord standing upon the breastwork of the pulpit before us and under his feet was a paved work of pure gold in color like amber. His eyes were as a flame of fire. The hair of his head was white like the pure snow. His countenance shone above the brightness of the sun, and his voice was as the sound of the rushing of great waters, even the voice of Jehovah, saying, I am the first and the last. I am he who liveth. I am he who was slain. I am your advocate with the Father. Behold, your sins are forgiven you. You are clean before me. Therefore, lift up your heads and rejoice. Let the hearts of your brethren rejoice, and let the hearts of all people rejoice who have with their might built this house to my name. Now you remember the week before in the prayer they were asking him to accept this house. And then in verse 7 he says, For behold, I have accepted this house, and my name shall be here, and I will manifest myself to my people in mercy in this house. The Kirkland Temple holds a particular place in the annals of temple building. It wasn't like the temples that we have today. It was built primarily to restore the keys of authority. In the Kirkland Temple, there was no provision for salvation for the dead. They didn't really understand that process yet. It hadn't been revealed. You remember it's line on line, precept on precept. It had no baptismal font. It had no prov provision for endowment ordinances. It was a temple, however, and fully answered the purpose of its creation. The Kirkland Temple filled its mission shortly after the time of its dedication, was to allow the keys to be restored. In 1836, the Lord prophesied that the fame of his house would spread to foreign lands. That, considering the circumstances, was at best improbable. The church members were but a handful of saints living and scattered throughout rural areas, but despite the persecution and struggles and trials of those early days, there are congregations now spread literally across the world, and tens of thousands of missionaries bearing witness at every door where they are welcome. That from President Packer. So after the first vision closed, which was the Lord Jesus Christ, the heavens were opened again, and Moses appeared before them, and committed unto them the keys of the gathering of Israel, 
from the four parts of the earth in the leading of the ten tribes from the land of the north. And after that, Elias appeared and committed the dispensation of the gospel of Abraham, saying that in us and in our seed all generations after us shall be blessed. After this vision had closed, another great and glorious vision burst upon them. For Elijah the prophet, who was taken to heaven without tasting death, stood before them. From President Nelson, the October 2003 General Conference. You know something about keys. In your pocket there may be a key to your home or car. Priesthood keys, on the other hand, are intangible and invisible. They switch on the authority of the priesthood. Some keys even convey power to bind in heaven as well as on earth. Joseph Smith conferred priesthood keys upon all twelve. These keys have been transferred to successive leaders. Today, the president of the church holds authority for every restored key held by all those who have received a dispensation at any time from the beginning of creation. I just think it's kind of funny that President Nelson said that back in 2003, and now he's the one who's the president of the church, the prophet, who holds all of the keys. From Bruce R. McConkie, Elias brings back the gospel of Abraham, the great Abrahamic covenant, whereby the faithful receive promises of eternal increase, promises that through celestial marriage their eternal posterity shall be as numerous as the sands upon the seashore, as the stars in heaven for multitude. Elias gives the promise received of old by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that in modern man and in their seed all generations shall be blessed. And we are now offering the blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to all who will receive them. The coming of Elijah in the Kirkland Temple fulfilled the Old Testament prophecy given by Malachi, that Elijah would return before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. In doing so, Elijah's appearance coincided, though not by coincidence, with the Jewish Passover season, which tradition reverently anticipates Elijah's return. In fact, most Jewish families set a place for Elijah at their Passover table, and they fill a cup to the brim and invite and welcome him. At some point during the Passover meal, they send a child to the door, sometimes left partially open to see if Elijah is waiting outside. In fulfillment of this prophecy, as part of the promised restoration of all things, Elijah did come as promised at Easter and on the onset of Passover. It's not every year that Easter and Passover actually coincide, but this happened to be a time when they did. He brought the sealing authority to bind families on earth and in heaven. As Moroni taught the prophet Joseph, Elijah shall plant in the hearts of the children the promises made to their fathers, and the hearts of the children shall turn to their fathers. If it were not so, Moroni continued, the whole world would be utterly wasted at the Lord's coming. The spirit of Elijah, a manifestation of the Holy Ghost, draws us to our generations, past, present, and future, in our genealogies, histories, and temple service. It's interesting to note that this particular promise is actually found in each of the standard works. I think it's the only one. Okay, this is from Richard G. Scott, October 2012 General Conference. I testify that the spirit of Elijah is touching the hearts of many of our father's children throughout the world, causing the work for the dead to accelerate at an unprecedented pace. But what about you? Have you prayed about your ancestors' work? Set aside those things in your life that don't really matter? Decided to do something that will have eternal consequences? Perhaps you have been prompted to look for ancestors but feel you are not a genealogist. Can you see that you don't have to be one anymore? It all begins with love and a sincere desire to help those beyond the veil. Check around. There will be someone in your area who can help you have success. I know that in our ward we have several people who are called the family history consultants. And it's really not that difficult. There was a time when it was pretty difficult to do uh, genealogy. I remember my dad when we first joined the church. He would write away letters to his home area which had been devastated by war and taken over by a different country. And it was really difficult. He would have to send his letters written in three languages and pay money to get little bits of information. But now there's so much available through the indexing program that's just right at your fingertips. This work is a spiritual work, a monumental effort of cooperation on both sides of the veil, where help is given in both directions. Anywhere you are in the world, with prayer, faith, and determination, diligence, and some sacrifice, you can make a powerful contribution. Begin now. I promise you that the Lord will help you find a way and it will make you feel wonderful. 
Priesthood authority has existed in many dispensations. Adam, Noah, Enoch, Abraham, Moses, the Meridian of Time, the Jaredites, the Nephites. All previous dispensations were limited in time as each ended in apostasy. They were also limited to small segments of the planet Earth. In contrast, our dispensation, the one that we live in today, the dispensation of the fullness of time, will not be limited in time or place. Globally, it will host a whole, complete and perfect union, welding together dispensations, keys, powers, and glories from the days of Adam even to the present time. And we get to live during this time. The Aaronic Priesthood was restored in 1829, May, by John the Baptist. The Melchizedek Priesthood was restored shortly thereafter by Peter, James, and John. Other heavenly messengers conveyed specific keys of the priesthood. Moroni held the keys of the Book of Mormon. Moses brought keys of the gathering of Israel and the leading of the ten tribes. Elias conveyed keys of the restoration of all things, including the Abrahamic covenant. And Elijah conferred keys of the sealing authority. As I was leaving the parking lot today at church, a sister in the ward asked me where she could find the dedicatory prayer for the Calgary Alberta Temple. And so I told her, basically all you have to do is, is type into the search bar, Calgary Alberta Temple Dedicatory Prayer, and you'll get one of two sites. There's this site that's hosted by our church website, and then there's another one hosted by the temple website. But you can see here that, that this particular prayer is specific to our area, and they're individualized. And I did notice when I was reading through it the other day that there are some specific blessings to the youth of our area that are worth reading about. Find a way to make an appointment regularly with the Lord to be in his holy house. Then keep that appointment with exactness and joy. Then from Elder Holland we have this plea. If you made covenants, keep them. If you haven't made them, make them. If you have made them and broken them, repent and repair them. It's never too late, so long as the master of the vineyard says there's time. Please listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit telling you right now, this very moment, that you should accept the atoning gift of the Lord Jesus Christ and enjoy the fellowship of His labor. I testify to you that if you put the time in, if you put the study in, that the Lord will bless your efforts, that you'll have great insights into what's contained in the Doctrine and Covenants and what you can learn in the Temple. I had a great time this week studying Sections 109 and 110. 109 is such an elaborate prayer, such a deep feeling prayer, that it created 110, section 110. That's a brilliant answer. I think sometimes we pray casually, and then we get casual answers. I encourage us all this week to study the Doctrine and Covenants that we can understand and take advantage of of having a temple right here in our midst. I hope that helps you in your study this week. I'll see you on Wednesday for our midweek panel discussion. Hope you have a great week.